I mean, we are on the road, so you hear the cars go by, especially the, the audio hears the cars go by. And, uh, but we don't want people killing over either, so if you get hot, we'll pop the doors back open again. So did everyone love their dinner? Yes. 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 Elizabeth Hicken told me, and she's been to a lot of covered dish suppers, that this was the best one ever. So, And I love the fact that everyone had so much fun sitting talking that no one was rushing to get on to the next portion of the uh, evening. I don't know if the hot weather affected our attendance, um, but those of us that came had a good time, and too bad for those that missed it. Uh, we want to thank Rally Cable. Lynn from Rally Cable is videotaping, so that if those people that didn't make it tonight, um, it'll be on at some point. Not tonight, but at some point they'll edit it and it'll be on. So if you miss anything, you can watch it again. Um, everyone got their fill? No one's going home hungry? Hungry? Uh, we want to thank Jane Boyer and Janet Peabody and Kathy Cousins for setting up everything tonight. I'd also like to point out that we're missing Amber Hovey tonight, who has set up for us for these dinners for years and years. When the girls came yesterday, they didn't know where the stuff was, where the placemats were. Where, um, and Amber's husband, Don, um, fell and broke his pelvis, I believe. And uh, today is Thursday, so maybe Wednesday or Tuesday or Wednesday. And he's now in rehab in Beverly, so Amber felt <laughs> rightly so that she should be with him. But we miss them being here, yeah. especially Don was a police officer in Raleigh, and he always has stories. I think he would have enjoyed what you have to say, and he would have enjoyed uh, sharing stories with you. The story that Amber used to tell um, is, you know, this is a little tiny department, and um, he would be riding around in his cruiser, and Amber would have the phone. No such thing as a dispatch department. She would just have the phone. And so she would get a call at her house, which I think is 366 Central Street, where Jeff is now, and they would say, we need help at whatever. And she would take the radio, and she had to go someplace in the yard where she could get reception on the radio. She couldn't call from the house. She had to take the, the radio oh. and go out to that spot in the ad that she could get reception. And then she'd call the cruiser to tell them what the telephone calls it. We still have that problem. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Someone else told us at uh, a meeting we had last week, who was it that said, maybe Elizabeth said, they had a police chief, Hayes, Hayes and Jewett, who didn't have his driver's license. So his wife had to drive him to calls. <laughs> so Amy, you all set? <laughs> I, I, I just <laughs> That's beyond belief. <laughs> That's beyond belief. Uh, we want to thank everyone who helped uh, support our, uh, our plant sale that we had last Saturday, uh, especially Cressy's Greenhouses and um, Country Gardens, Bill Freitag from Country Gardens. Bill donates all the flowers that we sell at the, at the uh, plant sale. So that's a huge money maker. Um, Sam didn't know he'd be called to perform tonight, but I think he said uh, we took well, in about $1,500 and then well, after paying well, Cressy's. What I'll tell you is that if I remember correctly, I deposited $1,528 and I uh, wrote a check out for 852 which comes out somewhat as just shy of 700 uh, the one thing is the fifteen twenty eight may not have been the full amount of the receipt, so I'm not quite sure. He's, he's just remembering it from Saturday. Uh, we uh, hope you all noticed the new tree we have out there. Yeah. Did everyone notice the tree? We've been trying to plant that poor little tree for three years. <laughs> First, we were going to put the roof on, and we didn't want the tree there where the roof is there. And Then last year it was too uh, dry, and uh, we had contracted for the tree, but he just didn't want to put it in when we had no water. And then uh, this year, the spring started off well, and uh, so he caught me the other day, and he said, I'm going to put the, the tree in on Thursday. So um, the tree's in, and um, it, it's being paid for by the Jack Farrell Memorial Fund. Uh, many of you remember Jack Farrell, who was a former president of the society, and when he passed away several years ago, um, they uh, put in the paper to send donations to his memorial fund here, and it's still paying for little things. So he's paid for that little garden and the granite bench that's out there. Our thanks also to Brooke Todd, Shirley and Frank Todd's son, who did the heavy lifting and did, he's a landscaper and he put that in. And, and then we'll thank in advance for all the people that we're going to reach out to and say, can you come and water the plants today? Because it's a huge operation to keep these plants watered. Uh, now with the tree, it needs huge amounts of trees. Uh, not huge amounts of trees, it's huge amounts of water. 
Um, we also have a couple things planned for the summer. We want to paint the side of the building. If you notice, it's all kind of getting uh, worn. We just want to paint this side. Um, we want, uh, we're looking at an estimate for repair of this barn roof. We had a lot of uh, shingles that came off in this winter and uh, we have someone coming to look to see what needs to be done and we're hoping it's an easy fix because I don't know if we're prepared to do the whole, well we're not going to do it, but I'm not sure we're going to be prepared to pay for that whole roof to be done again. Uh, so keep your fingers crossed. Um, we're also looking to start a project on the museum room upstairs. Um, we have through the generosity of people, all kinds of things being donated to us, as in this room, and that room just gets more and more crowded. Things are in archive boxes, but they need to be off the floor, they need to be in cabinets, and so we're working with the library to see if we can start a project, and uh, hoping hoping we can make some solid progress by next year when we have our 100th anniversary. Next year, the Historical Society will be 100 years old, and if we could get that one project done. <laughs> That would be that would be a very good testament uh, to, to the celebrations. And I talked about Amber and Dawn, so I already mentioned that. So unless we have anything else to add, um, this isn't a business meeting. We don't have to do elections or anything else. We'll do that in September. But I'd like to turn to our special guest speaker of the evening, uh, Scott Dumas and his wife Amy, way in the back row. Uh, we had dinner with Scott and Amy and had a delightful time. I think they enjoyed the Sundays. <laughs> Everyone likes the Sundays. Um, so as many of you know, Scott's been here a little more than a year now, and uh, he's been very interested in getting to, out to meet the public and get the public to meet him. Uh, so I know when he first started, he had a coffee with the chief at the library, but now he's been here a year. So I'm sure you have a little different perspective after being here a year. And I read, I think in the town report, you're talking about a bike patrol maybe? Yes. And so he has all kinds of ideas for things coming up. And so I hope you'll give him your attention and uh, you're on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope... Uh, Sue said it was light attendance. I hope it wasn't because we advertised where the speaker was. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to, uh, first of all, I do. I, I want to thank Sue for, for inviting me to, to come here and, and speak with this group, any group, you know, within the, within the town of Raleigh. It's something I enjoy doing. It's something I've been trying to do. And hopefully you'll see more than just me out there in the public. You're going to see officers doing doing things like this because I really think it's, it's just part of what we do. Um, I'm going to work from an outline because if I don't work from an outline, one of two things happens. One, I either stray and I start talking about things that I never intended to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> or two, Could be interesting. I get lost. You know, and, 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 and the discussion is very short. You know, so and I, and I have to sit down. So uh, every now and again, I'm going to refer back to this, uh, this outline. I have big font, so sometimes I'll have to put the glasses down just to make sure. But uh, for now, I, I wrote it big enough where I can where I can read it. I think. Um, so first thing, you know, what I did when I when I was asked to come here to the historical site, I, I, I researched the Platts Bradstreet house. I had no idea what it was, whom, whom, I'd be, whom I'd be speaking with, what, you know, what talk, topic uh, of discussion we had, and I, and I learned about, the, I learned about the, the history of the place, and I can tell you for a fact, do not believe in Wikipedia, <laughs> because uh, the Wikipedia page is not always correct. Based upon the information I had and the tour, little tour that I had with Sue earlier, the years are off a little bit, you know, so, um, and, and they tell you not to, as a matter of fact, colleges won't even utilize that, that site because because people can add things that they wanted to do. So according to Wikipedia, this was in place in 1920, not 1918. Um, and so the sewer has, has um, challenged that <laughs> that's right, a couple of times. Um, but that's not the, that's not the, um, the only thing I, uh, history, I mean, the first thing when I became chief of police here in the, in the town of Raleigh was we have a very unique patch here. And on the patch is old Nancy. You know, so when I first applied, you know, for the for the town of Raleigh, that was the first thing I had to look up. What the heck is Old Nancy? You know, and it was a very interesting story about the Boynton brothers. And you know, and if you do any Google searches right now, Bob and Sue, you know, they're all uh, quote, quoted in the in the whole topic and the story and the rivalry between Georgetown and Raleigh. And, and Jimmy Bobolad is a Boynton. Oh really? Okay. <laughs> Which one, the Raleigh Boynton or the, or the Georgetown Boynton? Because the way the, the way I wanted to settle it was the major Eben Boynton was from 
Say it with me. Yeah. Rowley. Yeah. Right? So it was his canon originally. He got it, so it's Rowley's canon, right? That's what and we think. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I didn't know, though, was that uh, the Chief Bob Hardy, rest his soul, was the, was the person who designed this patch. Really? You know? uh, oh. and, and so that's something, even if I, I, mean, I have no desire to, but it, you know, just learning that is something I would never change, you know, now knowing that. Uh, yeah. Hey, it's a very unique patch. Um, I recently uh, I was at a chief show and there was a chief there that he saw the patch and he said, "Well, oh, I could have that patch." And he starts talking to his second in command, talking about oh, Nancy. His secretary name is Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Well, I'll give you the patch, but you don't tell where it came from." <laughs> <laughs> you know? So um, my experience has been here. I, I've been here over a year, and, and every place I've gone, you know, from from the time the first time I was interviewed to uh, all the way through being hired and, and every contact that I've had, I've had great uh, warm receptions from the people of Rowley. I, I have not had a negative reception, knock on wood, there's plenty of wood in here, real wood. Um, I have not had a negative experience yet. And it, it will happen, you know, Chief of Police, it's gonna happen. But I have not, I have not had that experience yet. Um, and so I'm very appreciative of that. Everywhere I go, um, you know, the small town is here in, is in, in, town. in the town of Rowley, um, which, one of the things that, um, you know, when I talk about Raleigh, um, I'll be honest, when I applied for it, uh, you know, I was familiar with Raleigh, and, and, and when I say familiar, I mean I knew where it was, okay? <laughs> I knew it was a town that you drove through, you know, west between Georgetown and Ipswich to go to Essex to play hockey, <laughs> and if I was fortunate enough and I was good and my dad was hungry, we'd stop at the Agawam Diner on the way back, and we'd have breakfast. Um, so that was my experience with, with, with Raleigh. Um, and, um, and it's not until you get into into here, which I know I'm preaching to the choir, there's a lot of old time residents that are here that, that, have, that, have, that, have, that have lived it and grown it and just the discussions there and dinner talking about just the little knickknacks within the town, it's just, uh, was incredible. So I didn't know what it was that I, you know, that, that I was going to come here and, and to talk to you about it. So I said, you know, when Sue asked me, I said, yeah, I'd love to come down and talk. What should I talk about? <laughs> she says, well, anything you want to talk about? I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, you know, that kind of goes by, you know, a week, week or so ago, and I'm just pondering what the heck I'm going to talk about. And then I, I pick up the town common, I read in the town common, um, that uh, I'm invited to dinner, which was nice. I knew that part. <laughs> and, uh, and it says that um, I will give a review of my first year as Chief of Police in Raleigh and hopefully some helpful security tips, including all the telephone scans we've been receiving. So my topic for discussions has been set. <laughs> we um, talked about that in your office. Yes, we did. We, yes, we did. <laughs> I didn't bring that up. No, no, no. We, uh, the scan file. That's right. We talked about the scan file. Um, so... But a week later, well, actually it was last week, I says, oh, by the way, how long am I speaking for? Oh, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes. And I says, 20, 30 minutes? I says, okay, well, then I'm going to have to talk very slow. <laughs> you know, in order to get there. Now, and, and um, I got to tell you, that's that's difficult for me because I, I'm going to, there's apologies up front, there's, there's uh, two, two habits. One is when I get excited or when I get going, I start talking faster. So slowing down is going to be a little bit difficult for me. And the other thing, I don't know if you've noticed it yet, my name is Dumas. Um, that's French. It's uh, phonetically D-O-O-M-I-S. The proper pronunciation is Dumas, but I only admit to being Italian. <laughs> okay? So my, my grandmother is 100% Sicilian Italian, and I don't know why. I got the, you know, I was looking Italian. I was always a Italian kid. I said, I'm Italian. Whenever anybody asks me, I'm Italian. You know, so... Italians, we speak with our hands. That's one thing that I haven't talked to. So, if I get going quick and I get flailing, it's just to distract you, you know, <laughs> so you don't know. You're not really paying attention. Um, so, okay. So, in the in the, in the spirit of, uh, of of history and historical society, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little bit about my background. Um, and Bob and Joe, I apologize because I know you've already heard this at least portions of it once. So, but it's uh, it's gonna be a little bit of repeat from you. I um, um, I'm from Groveland. Um, you know, my wife Amy is from West Newbury, so we, grew, we both grew up in this area. Um, I worked for t almost 21 years in the, in the city of Rochester. 
Rochester, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Rochester, it's about 29,000 uh, people census, 34,000 people in reality. Uh, it's a city, it's a busy city. We have about 60 sworn officers up, uh, up, in, up in Rochester. It's straight up to Spalding Turnpike, about 20 miles north on, uh, uh, from Portsmouth. It's a good little city. Um, great city if you want to be a police officer. Uh, great city if you, want to, if you want to learn things. Not the best city to grow up for, for bringing up your kids. Um, you know, which is one of the reasons why Amy and I, you know, moved down to Merrimack when our kids got in, got in uh, school age. Um, it was kind of a rough city, you know. I mean, when I first started in Rochester, some of the things that that, uh, that we had to do, there was a few streets in town that if we had got dispatched there, we generally didn't go with our blue lights. And the reason for that is we didn't want to let people to know we were coming. And we generally had to put a police officer with the cruiser because it would be vandalized, you know, while we were out there making the call. You know, so it's a rough little town, but based upon you know some chiefs that I wound up working for, um, we changed the culture. I think the town over the 20 years that I've been in, we certainly improved the culture of the city as far as you know uh, the respect for law enforcement, but also the respect for each other and the respect for their neighbors uh, growing up. And, I, and you know, I'd, I'd like to think I had a, I played a role in that. You know, I was able to go through the ranks in the city of Rochester, held every rank there from patrolman. Sergeant, detective, sergeant, lieutenant, detective, lieutenant, um, captains, and up to deputy chiefs. And as that progressed, so did our uh, functioning of policing and how we police the city. Um, great story that I that I, I like to tell uh, in regards to uh, City of Rochester. When I first made captain, which is back in 2006. One of the first challenges I had was to employ the first citizens academy in a in the town of in the city of Rochester. Never had a citizens academy. Well, the biggest thing wasn't getting the citizens to come; was getting the police officers to get involved. Um, and the reason being is because, as I told you, it was a rough city, and in a, in a lot of the things that we dealt with, call to call, call to call, call to call, there was not a lot of positive experiences that police officers had, you know, in in the city. A lot of the, the contacts that we had with the public was the negative contact because we were dealing with the 20% of the people that just didn't want to get in line. We weren't even aware of the 80% 80 80 of the people that, was, that lived in the city. So it was like pulling teeth to the, to, the, to the point where we actually had to order officers to come in. No, you're going to come in here this night on this from 6 to 9 on Tuesday and you're going to talk about this subject. But you're an expert, ex, expert. That's not a good premise to get somebody in there to teach a class. You know? But we had to do that with some of these folks. It's an 11-week course. By the time we were done, my officers were asking, when's the next one? And the reason being is because the people that attended the Citizens Academy were the 80%. They weren't the 20% of the people. The people that wanted to be involved, the people that wanted to be engaged, the people that wanted to talk. And it enabled us to, to teach the officers a lesson to remember, A, why they put the badge on, but B, that those folks are out there. And those are truly the folks we serve. The other folks, those are the that's the ones we're, we're just dealing with, you know. People were serving of the 80% of them, and we had to be reminded of that aspect of it. Um, so I really enjoyed my time in Rochester. Um, educationally, really quick, I got a bachelor's degree in Justice and Public Safety at Marvin University in, in Montgomery. I have a bachelor's degree at university, I mean a master's degree at the University of Oklahoma in administrative leadership. I attended the Babson College Command School, uh, and I'm a graduate of the FBI National Academy, and I currently serve on the FBI National Academy Executive Board, National Board. Uh, and I get to raise my right hand in July, and Joe's coming down with his wife and uh, to be sworn in as president. And it's gonna be a, um, it's gonna be a tough year, it's gonna be a busy year, uh, but it's, it's gonna be something that's been on this board for, that, that would be a culmination of nine years and then the seven right now. Um, as far as my training, you know, I had all kinds of training. There's one thing the city of Rochester is good for you. Uh, was training, you know, they threw training at you left and right, which was good. Um, certified instructor in weapons of mass destruction, incident command system, firearms, citizens response to active shooter uh, uh, event. Um, that's my that's my professional side. Now my personal side, married, um, three uh, three kids. My daughter Casey, she's 22 years old. Um, she graduated college, UMass Dartmouth, um, a graphic designer. And she got a job right out of college, of um, uh, in her in her field, 
my wife and I said we were how proud of where we were. She goes, what, you didn't think I was going to get a job? <laughs> right? She says, no. You, you know, she had no idea how difficult it is, A, to get a job, but also B, to get a job in your field. In your field. You know? And so she's very fortunate. She works with all industries, um, and she's doing great. My uh, oldest son, and she's my, older, my only daughter, my oldest son, Alex, is in the Marine Corps, uh, stationed over in Hawaii. Um, Strangely enough, he's not crazy about Hawaii. I mean, who doesn't love Hawaii? He likes Hawaii, <laughs> but he doesn't love Hawaii, you know. And you know, he's a New England boy. He likes to, he likes to change the seasons. He misses the cold. Uh, he likes he likes to be home. Um, and my son uh, Tucker, who took a year after after high school, uh, took a year off, but he's going to be attending Johnson and Wales of Culinary Arts in the fall. Uh, and I like the kid, uh, when I'm talking to groups about my son Tucker, if he was born first, he'd be an only child. <laughs> uh, uh, but he's, he's a character, and, and I, I'm blessed with three great kids. And uh, last but not, but not least, my wife Amy is sitting in the back uh, room. Some, uh, I hope everybody met. If you didn't, group, this is Amy. Amy, this is the group. Um, Amy and I have been married 25 years this August. Um, uh, and if you count the... 11 years that we dated prior to that, you know, so that makes us, you know, uh, 36 years. So we, we know each other. Um, so you're sitting here probably, uh, there's, there's, there's some of you saying, all right, Chief, thanks for your resume and your personal life, but, uh, you know, what relevance does that have to the, to the discussion that you want to talk about? Well, I, I think it's important. I, I'm not from Raleigh. I didn't, I, I, I didn't. Um, come to the Raleigh Police Department, you know, and, and I know the folks that are here, you know the cops in town, you know who they are, you've known them forever, you know what they're like, um, but you don't really know what I'm like, and, and, maybe, and, and, and maybe you don't know what drives me and what motivates me as far as the philosophy that, I'm, that, I'm, that I wanted to bring to the town of Raleigh, and I hope the reason why, you know, the, you know these two gentlemen had a, had a role in, in hiring me. I want you to know who I am, what drives me, and why I'm instituting some of what I am in, within the town and, and being able to get out there. I think it's important for you to know what that foundation is, you know, before we discuss and reflect upon the first year and maybe have a better understanding as far as why I've instituted some of the things that I have. Um, and the other message I want to send is that uh, is we're wide open. You know, uh, we're here to serve. As, as, as a police department, and that, that's not a, that's not a, uh, a throwaway term, that, that is something that we do, you know, to protect and to serve, and to serve the public, and understand what your needs are, and then be able to try to provide them for you, you know, that's what we're looking to do. Um, you've all heard the, uh, uh, I mean, it's an old saying, and it's, it's one that's, you know, I think it's very rele relevant, relevant, uh, relevant still, but we don't see as much of it. It takes a village, and we've all heard that. We've all heard that comment. It takes a village. I mean, back when we were all growing up, your neighbors knew what you did. Your neighbors knew what you did wrong, and your neighbors would whack you in the tail if you did something wrong. And your parents were glad for it, and they weren't calling them. They weren't going to sue. You know, they were going to whack you again because you did what was wrong. And you know, and, and but you, you don't have that anymore. You know, everyone's. It, it's just a different way. Of, uh, of growing up, it's a different way that you have to do it, but it still takes a village to effectively raise kids, um, and that's something that you know that's something that I, I believe in wholeheartedly. Everybody has to be involved, the neighborhood as much as they can, the teachers as much as they can, the police officers as much as they can. The problem being is that the neighbors can't whack you in the tail anymore, you know. The teacher's authority isn't, you know, just because I'm standing up there with my nose, my glasses is down here, my hair pulled back in a bun, doesn't mean I'm going to get the respect for the, from the kids. Just because I walk, I, I show up and I get a badge in a blue, in a, in a, in a blue uniform, doesn't mean I'm going to get the respect that it used to have, you know, back in that. But it still takes a village, so we have to take a different approach. And that rep that different approach is the whole relationship concept. You know, building those relationships or. or Reinvested in the relationships that we that we have uh, or need uh, to develop from the kids. And where's the best you know where's the best place to develop those relationships? Right there at the vine, you know. Um, which is why one of the, one of the um, things they first did when we when we came here is introduce the school lunch program with the um, with the kids, where the officers just go in there and they have lunch with the kids. You know, they don't well they just hang out and they talk with them and. Um, see what's going on, all the grades levels, 
Uh, kids love it. They love it more when they're little. The sixth graders, not so much. But they did at the beginning, and now they're just kind of, you know, ignoring you, you know, when you're there. But you kind of force yourself on them, sit down on there. So, how's recess? What are you doing? What's going on? And they reluctantly talk, and they turn, and they look at you. But you, 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 a little bit at the time, you're building that relationship, and they're, they're talking. And all of a sudden, you know, there's two sixth graders today talking to me about poems that they had to write. When they did clearly did not want to talk about the poem. Let's come on, tell me about the poem. You had to write a poem? You forced to? Yeah. I forced to write a poem. What was it about? <laughs> I, I don't want to talk. I said, I said, all right. Well, so I, I said, okay. So I started talking to somebody else, and he starts talking about his poem, and then this one starts tripping. I'm saying, no, you don't want to talk. Right? You know, so it's, if, you, if you kind of put yourself there, you're starting to develop those relationships, and all of a sudden you're in market basket, you're in the post office, or you're down at the ball field, and the kids are coming up to you, and they're talking to you, and they're telling their parents about it, and it just makes... A, a, a big difference and now all of a sudden some of the things that you're talking to them about you know were the choices that were made the second thing that I tried to introduce into it was the uh, the lead program at uh, at Pine Grove School it's law enforcement against drugs uh, that's what it's called but you know what um, it, it, there's not a whole lot of discussion on drugs at this level they talk about it because they're there Okay, they are out there, uh, even if the, even in the sixth grade, even in Pine Grove, these kids know about it, they see it on the internet, there's probably, you know, some usage, or they see their parents using. Okay, so you have to have that discussion. But this, this program is developed for choices. It's really about choices, good choices, bad choices, and you start, and the, the thing that I really liked about this pro program, as opposed to the D.A.R.E. program, not the D.A.R.E., is a bad program because I don't think it's a bad program, but it's gotten a lot of negative knocks on it, you know. So I decided to just look at something when I was going to introduce it to Pine Grove, something a little different. This program st uh, stuck out uh, stuck out to me because it, it was it starts at, it actually has a curriculum for kindergarten kids, and it goes all the way up through 12th grade. So you can start here and you can go all the way to, to through to high school if you if you choose to. We introduced this to the sixth graders just as a, as a pilot program. We've got, we've got great reviews. We're going to bring it back to the sixth grade and maybe additional grade next year. Again, it, it, now we're fighting for time. You know, when the curriculum, they only have so many things, so many hours in a day that they have to balance. So if we can, we will. Uh, but it, 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 got, um, it got a little um, uh, great feedback. And i, and I got to tell you, you get a, uh, the Pine Grove the Pine Grove School, the staff, the teachers, the principals over there, they're, they're just they're, they're wonderful with the kids. Everybody from the principal all the way down to the custodian has an investment with those kids over there. And that's what you need, especially in a small town. And everybody has to be part of it. Again, it takes a village. Um, so this, this Raleigh Police Department had the Citizens Academy. We try to introduce it here. Uh, and this is some of the things that we that we uh, ran into later on years in Rochester where before we had Probably getting the police officers there, they run them. It's the citizens. You know, everyone's too busy. It's 11 weeks. Well, Raleigh had had a program, pretty good program. Read the curriculum. Captain Sedgwick actually was uh, a big part of, um, of talking about the uh, of, of teaching that program. Um, but we we got two people to sign up. You know, so we're going to put it up again until next year. But we're going to we're going to keep trying. Um, and. You mentioned the bicycle patrol. Well, I actually picked up the bicycle patrol this week. We picked up the bicycle, um, uh, and we're going to have you. You'll see this. Currently, two officers who are interested in, in being bike patrol officers. I think eventually everybody's going to want at least be trained on the bicycle. And you're going to see officers, whether it's uh, on patrol, it's designed. We've got a nice uh, rack where it can go on the back of a cruiser. You can drive if they're on just regular patrol, even with two people. We generally have two people on, so they can put the bike on the back, get out in the neighborhood, pedal around. Even if they get a call, they can pedal to the bike. It's a quick on and off, you know, so they can do it um, without too much trouble. And then um, it can also be utilized in some special events, whether you're down at Commons or whatnot. So these are some of the um, these are some of the outreach programs and, and some of what uh, we, we try to develop in that in the first year, and we're going to continue to do it. Um, I'm, I've been blessed too, also with the um, with the men and women who work in the, in the town of Raleigh. A lot of these, it's, it's a great combination right now. I got a lot of seasoned veterans, people who've been there 
been in law enforcement longer than I've been in law enforcement, and, and we got some brand new ones. And we got some brand new reserve officers, too, who are going to be quality reserve officers moving forward. As, as, as um, I don't know if you know, but we try to hire the full-timers from the reserve, from the reserve um, group, and these guys are, are uh, we just hired two um, uh, full-timers from the reserve group, and these guys have been in town for a long time. The good thing about the reserve group, unfortunately, is that we uh, we get a lot of work. We utilize them a lot, you know. So uh, that's the important thing. Um, so these folks are great. So they talk about oh, geez, I missed the whole section. Um, <laughs> see, see what happens. Um, that's all right. It's really about uh, community policing, you know. I mean, and uh, it takes the village aspect of it. Um, community policing has been around for a long time, so. Let's go his history a little bit. Right now, it's, you know, in some places it's a buzzword. People use it, utilize it as a buzzword. Um, oh yeah, we do community police. Not really. What are you doing? Well, um, we're out there. I said no, but really, what do you do? What you know? What, what does it mean to be community police? And it really, the community policing aspect of it is, you know, it takes a village. You really got to get involved. And actually, you know, uh, community policing has been around. Uh, I've been heard of Sir Robert Peel. Sir Robert Peel is um, is uh, considered the father of modern policing. You know, from the 1800s, he wrote nine uh, nine Peelian principles. Metropolitan police. Yep, from the, uh, from, the yep, from the UK, and then and then came back over. Uh, actually, a lot of what was developed over there. And th that's why they call uh, his name is Robert Peel. That's why they call the English police Bobbies. You know, because of the concepts that he that he um, that he put together. Anyway, he wrote nine. Um, uh, principles are called appealing principles. And you talk about community policing, which everyone says, "Wow, it's a new term, community policing." It's not a new term. It's was, it was back. It was principle number seven, you know, that he talked about. And it, it principle number seven is: police at all times should maintain a relationship with the public that gives reality to the historic tradition that the police are the public and the public are the police. The police being only members of the public who are paid to give full-time attention to duties which are incumbent upon every citizen in the interest of the community welfare in existence. So that's community policing in a nutshell. It talks about it takes a village, talks about it's everybody's responsibility to do it. We're just the ones that are in charge of it full time. You know? Um, so you know, a lot of the, if you read pretty much any police department mission statement, you will find uh, Robert Peel's principles littered throughout those mission statements. And the last one, you know, that it, that it um, um, Peel's, you know, final principle is, 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 and this is hopefully, you never truly get there, but this is what you always uh, aspire to, and this is what you work towards, and this is why you put the effort into doing what you do. And uh, the true measure, uh, this is the ninth principle, the true measure of the effectiveness of any police force is not the number of arrests uh, or police actions taken, but the absence of criminal conduct and violations of the law. You know, so if you're living in a community, which fortunately the town of Rowley is, it's it's one of those communities, and you know, and even though it's not that busy, when you look under the on the surface, when you look under the rug, there's there's some things going on here that you know that they're probably not aware of, uh, which is good. And I'm going to try to keep. Make sure that you stay unaware of them because we'll hopefully we'll be stamping out some of those some of those issues. But that's that's why that's what we work towards. That's what we work towards as a department, and that's what we need from you folks. And you need to demand from from your police department, and we are here to be demanded upon um, in that regard. So that is my reflection on um, my first year in, in, in uh, with the town of Rowley. But there's two parts here, you know, because we we're going to talk about some of the scams uh, that were available. We'll do this relatively quick. Some of the most uh, common telephone scams. Grandparents in the room. A lot of grandparents in the room. Have you heard of this? Have you heard about the grandparents scam? They, they, yeah. They call you on the phone. They say, "Hey, Grandma, it's, uh, it's Paul." You know. And, you know. You know. And, you know, you know, you're struggling to hear, and you're not, you're not really sure, but you don't want to say, oh, hey, Paul, how you doing? You know, you know and, and you tell them, yeah, there's something happening, and, uh, you, you know, I wound up in jail, I need, I need some money, or, or, you know, in a bad situation or whatnot. And they, um, 
now this now now then you're starting to question like ah maybe and all of a sudden they put their attorney on the phone you know and they tell you oh, you need to send you know yeah this is the attorney represent him this is where we're at you need to send the money you know asap to, to this thing and of course you know they're pulling my hardship whatever you do don't tell mom and dad they'll kill me you know they don't they don't know about this i know i can trust you grandma i know i can trust you grandpa you know just don't tell mom and dad well obviously you know first thing you do check on Paul, you know, hey Paul, you know, call cell phone. Good thing about that, even grandparents get cell phones now, right? You know, and and can text them. Hey, you know, so that's the first thing that you know, obviously check. Um, and you know, whenever you, whenever your grandchild tells you not to tell mom and dad, I mean, you know, that's going to get you in trouble one way or the other. Right, you know, <laughs> whether it's legit or not, you know, if you keep something from mom and dad. Um, so this is one that's probably going to be coming up again right now, the IRS scam. You know, people call about the IRS, the demanding things. You know, the, the, the thing I want to caution you about this thing, that I'm going to go over. Um, so the IRS scam, a lot of a lot of times are reaching out by email. The scams are reaching out by email. The IRS will always contact you by mail before ever reaching out via phone. That may be changing and that's the one thing that was always that catch-all you know um, that may be changing but for now you the, even though they'll contact you by phone you should receive a letter from the IRS prior to be contacted by phone okay uh, they will never demand immediate payment the you know, IRS will work with you back taxes they will work with you they want their money okay so they're not going to demand immediate payment go down to Western Union give me something right now or you're going to go to jail they'll never ask you for a specific type of payment. Um, they'll not threaten you with arrest or, or deportation. Uh, they won't request any personal information by email, texting, or any social media. Uh, and if you get email that claims to be from the IRS, just delete it because they're not going to contact you that way first. You know, so delete the email. Lottery and sweepstakes scams. Well, the first one is easy, right? If to, just find out that this is a, a, a scam. If you didn't enter, there's no way you want it. Okay? <laughs> Um, but sometimes uh, you'll get phone calls from foreign countries, you know, or people claiming to be from foreign countries and say, hey, you want to buy tickets to the, to the Portuguese uh, uh, lottery, you know, buy for buck, you know, or, or whatnot. It's, it's illegal for foreign countries to solicit lottery winnings, you know, in, in our country. It's illegal for foreign nations to solicit anything like that in our country. So, you know, it's a scam if that happens. And legitimate sweepstakes do not require that you pay anything to collect your winnings. Okay. Another one, 2020 is right around the corner, census-related uh, frauds. Uh, census Bureau, unfortunately, they have to call it. Census Bureau does call it, but they won't ask you for information such as your Social Security number. There's all t uh, ways in which they're trying to, uh, you know, identity theft. But never ask for, mo uh, for money or donations. They never ask for anything on behalf of a political party. Um, they'll never ask for a full uh, bank account or credit card numbers, and you know they'll never ask for your mother's maiden name. You know, which is the you know, that's that's the one that seems like everybody. The, you know, uh, you get a lot question. of complaints on that that mid census questionnaire that they send out. Census yeah. being year two thousand ten, two thousand twenty. Right. Somewhere in fifteen, they send they out up. about a ten-page questionnaire right. that people Those, limiting over. Right. But it's, I send it to the police. Yeah. <laughs> but some of the, I know, that's, and that's the thing. And this is why it's so difficult, you know, because some of those are legit. Yeah. You know, because they do take a census, a bid census, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's crazy. Um, charity scams. You know, th there are so many charity scams out there right now that, if, you know, I even write down, if we were to, if we were to talk uh, about charity scams, we'd be here all night. Um, there's, there's so many out there. And in particular, you need to be wary if you have a natural disaster, the Boston Marathon type of thing, you have a hurricane, a tornado. All of a sudden, there's going to be legitimate charities to set up, and then you have all these illegitimate charities that are, set, that are, that are set up in their home. The bottom line is, if it's something that you want to donate, something that you feel that you feel generous, get information from them. You know, they're going to be hesitant. If they're hesitant to provide it, there's, it's a scam. Okay, but if they do give you information, check out that information, or, or go to the or go to the site, you know, whatever you want to donate to, and donate directly there, as opposed to on the phone, um, because you know 
there, there, are, there, there are causes out there that, it, uh, that you may want to donate to, but you need to be wary. Um, <coughs> and the last one, uh, the last one I'll talk about is that ransomware. Um, that was just in the news, obviously, with FedEx and the UK, the health, ins the, the health insurance, where they they call and they, and they um, they send you. This is this is sent by email. These are scary. They encrypt your data. Um, it's you know it's they're, they're they're mostly targeting entities, corporations, um, something that can lock up where they can get money from it. Uh, so what basically what it does is they send you what seems like a legitimate email, and you click on the link, and all of a sudden your your all your data is encrypted. Uh, and they then they send this message says okay your data is encrypted you need you have three hours to send us X amount of dollars in bitcoins or whatever the Western Union if you don't your, your files will be gone and your files will be gone um, and there's no guarantee that even if you pay that and it's usually a small amount of money you know uh, that they'll get the, they'll get the data now there are some how uh, you say legitimate scammers where after you pay the ransom, they'll unleash your debt, you know, but the majority of them do not. They just keep asking you for more. Uh, the bottom line is on those type of things, if you're not familiar with the, the email or the link, sometimes you can, even it looks like it's, if it's uh, uh, from the Bank of America, if you hover over that, you know, just put your mouse over that. Sometimes, I mean, not all the time, because sometimes they're getting so good that it, it's, it's still showing legitimate. But usually, if you hover over that, it'll show whatever website it is. If that website changes, it's a scam. <coughs> the bottom line is on this whole thing is um, really, uh, well, actually, before I do that, I want to talk about it. There are some tips to protect yourself. Now, this first one I have written down here, you take this for a grain of salt. Uh, that's a national call, national do not call list, you know, as far as the, the, you know, the phone scams. I don't think it works. Um, but if you go on any uh, any website, any article here that talks about ways to protect yourself, this is one of the things that first comes up. Well, I get calls three, four, five times a day from robocalls. Clearly, my phone must not be on the list again, even though they say it doesn't expire. <coughs> so I went to register my phone yesterday. <coughs> and sure enough, my phone is listed. It was listed in 2006. You know, um, and I get these phone calls four, five, six times a day. So take that one for a grain of salt. Maybe I'd be getting 12 or 13 calls a day if I, if I didn't have that with my phone on the list. They're not supposed to call. You're supposed to be able to file a complaint with that do not call list if they do that, but good luck with that. The biggest way you can uh, is, uh, protect yourself is really just to be aware that they're out there and they're everywhere. Um, do your due diligence with um, uh, when you're checking it out. If it's some, if it's if it's something that you want to donate to, something you want to get involved in, then absolutely go ahead. But do your research before before you do it. And to and to quote a line from Nancy Reagan, you can always just say no. Mm -hmm. You know. So that's all I had uh, for you. I, I hope it was what you were expecting. Um, uh, I hope you learned a little bit about me and, and what I'm what I want to bring uh, to the town. I plan on being here until they kick me out in 10 years, um, but we'll see. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? No. Yes, sir. We're not from here. We're from Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, hi. We have a different aspect on law enforcement yeah. down there in Atlanta. Uh, I would like to know in Raleigh, what is the, how much is a ticket for going through a red light? And I'll tell you what it is in Atlanta. Yeah, uh, I believe. Don't quote me. It's been a long time since I wrote a ticket. Um, I believe a red light's one hundred thirty dollars. Yeah, that was two hundred. Yeah, yeah. It's not stopping at a, at a red light. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Well, it's they they don't want they want you to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we have speed traps down there, like you could not believe. Yeah, well, There's I know. There's different counties yeah. that plan on that. Yeah. My dad lives in Oklahoma. Okay. And um, and one of the things he always told me to do was make sure if I go through Broken Arrow, which is between Tulsa and Oak Mulgee, he lives in Oak Mulgee and Tulsa's the airport, if you're going through Broken Arrow, which you had to do it, you make sure you're going five miles an hour 
under the speed limit if you're going to go through Broken Arrow. Well, they're profiling. Yeah. They're profiling down in Atlanta. Yeah. They'll pick a young woman and they'll stop her. You were speeding, and it's costing her over two hundred dollars. Yeah. If you've got two people in the car and one is a witness, you're all right. Right. But if you're alone, watch out. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It is. It it, it uh, it's. <laughs> that doesn't take place up here. Uh, you know, I don't know. Um, there, are, there are some jurisdictions in Oklahoma, too, where you don't, you don't even get a say. They just mail you a ticket. You know, yeah. you, you're going down the highway, and, and they got a camera. Mm -hmm. yep. And they say, yep, you're going 79, it's in a 65, and they just mail you a ticket. You don't, you don't. Wow. Right? You don't even have a chance to say, I've got, I've got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Would an unmarked car ever pull you over? Yes. That's scary for a woman driver. I want that kind of yeah. big letters. So let, me, so let me tell you that. So what you should do is uh, make sure you pull over in a well-lit area, and you make sure that, that that person who's approaching your car is in is, is uniform to get the beds. You know, it needs to be up there. You can also continue to go, if whatever town you're in, you know, whatnot. You call 911. I, I am... I, I am being pulled over, well, someone it doesn't look like a police cruiser. They got blue lights, and you just continue to go slow as you're on the phone. If it's a cop, they'll tell you, "Yeah, that's a real police officer. Please pull over, man." We've had the people, that, and I understand that. It, it is. Yeah. So getting a, if, you know, first thing is getting a well lit area, you know, and see if you can, you know, make out exactly what it is. I keep a watch, I keep an eye on the neighborhood, and I'm very uh, vigilant and uh, noticing cars parked by the front of the house that uh, are empty, nobody in the car, and it's not uh, anyone that I recognize, any vehicle that I recognize. And I've had the uh, call the police, and they've come and investigated. But there was one time, there was another car on Bennett Hill, and uh, I didn't know whether I was going to call or, and I just happened to see, I uh, drove up to Route 1 and I saw one of your uh, patrolmen uh, parked by, uh, on the southbound side of Route 1. And I said, I'm going to stop and talk to him. So I went by him and I looped around and I came in behind him. And I scared the hell out of him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I bet you did. I bet you did. I can tell you some stories. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we'll just keep it positive. <laughs> we have a lot of carjacking, and I don't think it'll ever stop. I'm sorry. Yeah. You have to go into the gas station and you, and you pay $10 for the gas. When you go in, you lock your car. You come out, you gas up, and when you finish gassing up, you press your little button to unlock the car to get in. The hijacker jumps in on the passenger side, and yeah. he's got your car. You need to move to Raleigh. What happens? You moved away from Raleigh. Look what happened. I mean, we have Atlanta heat tonight. <laughs> We it's it's yeah it's tough it, it really is. It Atlanta's a tough Atlanta's a tough city. Mm -hmm. My wife and I lived in uh, Montgomery, uh, Alabama for three years and okay. and wow. um, you know so we're familiar with Atlanta, you know, <laughs> in, in that area. You know, mm -hmm. so. Atlanta's tough. Yeah, it is. Any uh, other questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I appreciate your presentation tonight. Um, I thought it was really informative. Thank you for your service. I have two young children, not of school age yet, and I'm fairly new to rally. I've been here about four years with my husband and my two sons. Do you have any recommendations in terms of things that young families should be looking out for? Are there any particular challenges that you see in your experience since you've been here that we should be concerned about? In terms of safety, I mean, I feel I feel safe. I, I live in a great neighborhood. I, we've met yeah. a lot of great people. I, I don't feel unsafe, but I'm just wondering if there's anything. I'm encouraged to hear the programs that you guys do at the, the school level. I think it's great. But yeah, no, this this I mean, there's nothing in, in this. This is a very very safe town. Yeah. You know, I mean, 
you can run into anything anywhere. But to, right. to say like, please stay off of that street, or boy, we're seeing a lot of this or that, it's, that's not going on, which is great, you know. And um, we have domestic issues right. as, in, in this town, like we did right. any town USA. There's some drug issues in this town, like there is any town USA. The volume of that is much is much lower. Um, and you know, uh, you know, so no, this is really nothing that I would that I would say. Hey, look out for that, or don't don't move over there, or, right. or uh, more along along the lines of what we're talking about right here. You know, you know the, the cyber stuff. You know, uh, to look out for um, just as a citizen. Those, those are the things. You know, when you live in a town such as this, you know, those are the things you really need to concern yourself with. Do you know if you register your mobile number, is it the same with the Do Not Call registry? Is it just friendly online? No, or you, no. Or your mobile too? Yeah, both. Yeah. And like I said, mine mine was registered. It's been registered for ten years. Yeah. I'm getting them. Um, I'm still getting the calls. My mom gets them all the time, but I don't. So uh, yeah. I also don't know if they target certain age groups. Well, it's a lot of robocalls too. Yeah. You know, and um, it, it's frustrating. It really is. Do you need to? Was it a question? My husband wants me to tell you a story. <laughs> Something <laughs> happened to me okay. on the way home. I'd gone chopping up the Sam's in uh, Seabrook mm -hmm. and had the back seat full of uh, goodies. My girlfriend went and with me and she had checked out with her things that she had got. So I'm coming down 95 towards Rowley and because I'm on the left hand side I really wanted to get home with all the groceries I had and the frozen things and everything. So I wasn't doing too bad on the speed. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden I heard this voice Stop, stop, pull, or stop. And I'm like, what the heck? So her and I are looking around. I couldn't see a police car or anything. And I was like, where the heck is that noise coming from? So I was like, well, I couldn't pull right over because it was cars on my right. So I'm trying to get down a little ways. I'm going slower and slower because everybody's passing me. one let me pull. And stop, stop again. And I'm like, I'm crying out loud. <laughs> Finally, I started to pull over. And the third time, he says, Stop! Stop! Get your hand out of the cookie jar. She bought a police cookie jar. <laughs> <laughs> I held her high. <laughs> and her husband was the police <laughs> As a joke for her, scared the living crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's funny. That was funny. <laughs> I've often thought they should ban uh, sirens on a radio broadcast. You're driving the car and suddenly yeah. some ding that has a an advertisement on that has a siren. Yeah. Okay. Where? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me where it is. They yeah. could, they shouldn't put it on the radio because you're yeah. I'm always looking for where that noise is coming from. This is true. Well how many times how many times have you get up to answer the phone when you're watching television? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. That's the same ring you got oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I hear a little ding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My wife was uh, teaching in Revere and she's coming home Route 1, and there's a state trooper right behind her. And so she makes her turn onto Wethersfield, and he makes a turn right onto <laughs> Wethersfield. And she makes a turn onto Benadil, and he makes a turn <laughs> onto Benadil. Only he was four houses down there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the other thing. There is a bunch of police officers that live in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. A bunch. Mm -hmm. a bunch. Yep. Must be a good place to live. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah so I guess. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta move back. You move back. From the Atlanta. Yeah. How did the New England Patriots beat the Atlanta Falcons? <laughs> 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 we, which team were you voting for? <laughs> Believe it or not, the Patriots. <laughs> it was a what a game. Oh, well, it was fantastic game. Because well, we won. But you must be quite <laughs> tired. Huh? Down 23, yeah, 24 yeah, points. Yeah, yeah. You must be quite a draw if they're coming from Georgia. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, thank you again for having me. And thank you for dinner. Thank you for dinner. It was great. You know, I, I mean, I tell you what, when Sue asked me, I'm like, yeah, free dinner. And then she goes, and bring your wife. I said, oh, cheap date. <laughs> cheap date, you know, so. But I wanted to let you know, today he said, do I need to bring a casserole? i like, do you cook? <laughs> so, no, my wife does. Well, it's like new time now. I, no, we have your she'd, she'd have been able to do it. So I hope uh, everyone had a good time. Everyone knows uh, what a big fan of Rowley I am. Um, 
I say to people, because you know my son is on the police department full time, but he's been on the fire department for many, many years, and people come into the office, and I said, it's a real small town atmosphere. I said, it's a good news, bad news thing. If you pick up the phone, dial 911, people you know will come to help you. The bad news is, people you know no. will come <laughs> to help you. <laughs> so you, you get it, it's a double edged sword. Um, we've always said, uh, uh, you know, if the fire department comes, certain people are not allowed upstairs. You know? <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm down in the bathroom, and someone said they, they had that rule about Chucky, and he was, you know. <laughs> but uh, it is true. You, you know the people, and it's a good thing, and uh, can be a bad thing at, at the same time. So I hope everyone appreciated tonight's um, um, speech, presentation. And did y'all learn something? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Very yes. Very good. Very good. Thank you Thank again. You. And uh, grab your casseroles and drive carefully. And I assume he'll talk to you if you want to talk to him afterwards. <laughs> I don't know if he's on a tight uh, schedule. I'm not. I'm not. Have, yeah, my honey. I also don't. <laughs> <have> <laughs>